Hi, this is Kendall Boyson, professional life and recovery coach, and you're listening to Encouragementology, the practice of instilling hope. Hi there. Thanks for joining me. On this show, we are checking it twice, looking to the horizon and consulting a trusted advisor as we discuss a clock, a compass, and a companion. This show is not to scare you with reminders like, you're running out of time, or look at you, you're still in the same spot, or even to provide a disclaimer like, you can't go it alone. Instead, it's to remind you how precious time is and how important it could be to identify what you want so you know where you need to go, and to encourage you to look to or strengthen your inner circle to provide love, support, and inspiration along your journey. We all desire to go somewhere emotionally, spiritually, and physically. Do you think that might require some mindful preparation? Ready to pack your bags and pause the mail? I attended a leadership conference yesterday and came away so inspired. So I would say they nailed it. Regardless of the business you're in, I think we can all appreciate a day of encouraging talks as we're reminded about the bigger picture and the mission in life. It's easy to get sucked into the day-to-day and lose sight of what's important. We have meetings, emails, deadlines, and endless to-dos. Even if you aren't running the rat race anymore, you can get preoccupied with the problems of the world and its perceived timelines and schedules. How much time do you spend in silence, pondering life, and preparing for what's next? That's right, silence. Not reading, watching, or listening to anything. Not surfing, clicking, or posting anywhere. Just thinking. Not reminiscing and rehashing or even ruminating. Just thinking. Time and space are so important to learn who, why, and what you need. Here is an ode to silence, why you need it in your life, and how to find more of it, found at healthclevelandclinic.org. Silence. Some of us welcome it. For others, the thought of sitting in the silence is enough to make our skin crawl. How much you value silence may depend on where you are and whether you're an introvert or extrovert. But whether you can work a crowded room with ease or are self-proclaimed homebody, silence should be a part of your day. Clinical health psychologist Amy Sullivan offers reasons why it's important, plus how to get started. Silence offers opportunities for self-reflection and daydreaming, which activates multiple parts of the brain. It gives us time to turn down the inner noise and increase awareness of what matters most. And it cultivates mindfulness, recognition, and appreciation of the present moment. Silence also has physical benefits. When we're frazzled, our fight or flight response is on overload, causing a host of problems, says Dr. Sullivan. We can use calm, quiet moments to tap into a different part of the nervous system. It helps us shut down our body's physical response to stress. That means being silent and still can help you lower your blood pressure, decrease your heart rate, steady your breathing, reduce muscle tension, Increase focus and cognition. Americans tend to struggle with stillness. There are cultural differences when it comes to welcoming silence. In America, FOMO, or fear of missing out, runs deep. Americans often use extra stimuli like devices or social media to distract themselves from personal thoughts or feelings that are uncontrollable or uncomfortable. Culturally, we tend to be less adapt to managing boredom through creative pursuits or a meditation practice. But spacing out creates opportunity to rest, relax, and recharge. Learning to sit in stillness and self-reflect is one of the greatest gifts we can give ourselves and our kids, says Dr. Sullivan. When we look internally and delve deeper into our value system and wants and needs, we can communicate at a deeper level, 
We have to foster that ability. Dr. Sullivan says silence helps us develop the skills to have more profound thoughts, stronger relationships, increased creativity, and improved communication skills. Introverts may be better adopters of quiet time. Dr. Sullivan says, Extroverts can be completely comfortable in boisterous situations, whereas introverts tend to be more reflective. They prefer smaller crowds and often have insightful thoughts. Because of this, introverts may be better positioned to appreciate still or calm moments. Society tends to value extroverts because they are more vocal or better presenters. But we have to recognize that introverts process information in a way that promotes creativity and problem solving because they talk less and listen more. There's huge value in that. Meditation is the practice of sitting in silence and focusing on the present moment. This is one of the best ways to incorporate quiet time into your day. For you and your children, set a timer for one minute. Spend that time just sitting or lying in silence. Dr. Sullivan recommends making it a daily practice. The first minute is quite difficult for many people. It's hard to sit still. Instead, people think about everything they need to get done while they're not doing it. Over time, though, you get good at it, you feel calmer, and you end up wanting more. As you cultivate a desire for silence, you can slowly increase the time until you're meditating 5 or 15 minutes in the morning or at night. But you don't need to have a formal meditation practice to find quiet time. You could try enjoying your morning coffee without a device or a magazine. Looking out the window the next time you're a passenger in the car instead of picking up your phone. Walking by yourself and listening to the natural noises around you instead of music. It doesn't have to be anything elaborate. Just take advantage of those quiet moments throughout the day and your mind and your body will thank you. It's probably why most people claim their best brainstorming happens in the shower. No interruptions, and the process is pretty automatic, so it takes little thought. But unless you're committed to a rise in your water bill, does that really give you the quiet time you need? Matt has no problems with this, and I'm often perplexed when I walk in his office and he's just sitting there. My first question is, what are you doing? He says, thinking. About what? I mean, I have to know. Just things, he says. To which I respond, huh. And I walk out. Why should this be so foreign to me? Well, I know why. I always have to be busy. Now, that isn't to say busy equals productivity. Believe me. It's not like I clean the house till it's time for lights out. But I usually keep my hands and mind occupied. During the conference, John Maxwell, world-renowned speaker, coach, and pastor, and author of The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership and The 21 Indispensable Qualities of a Leader, mentioned this notion of a clock, a compass, and a companion. First of all, I love things in threes. I'm not sure why, but now that I've called your attention to it, you'll see that I always gravitate to threes. Then I love the fact that all three words start with the letter C. And finally, the sentiment and reminder that time is important, direction is key, and friendship is critical. Time waits for no man. You've probably heard that saying, and it's true. Time marches on, and it's up to us to keep up with it. We need to be conscious of the clock, or we'll never make any progress towards our goals. But I believe there's more to success than reaching goals. True success comes from significance. Doing things that matter, things that last after we're gone, said John Maxwell. 
How do we know if we're doing what really makes a difference? We can't just look at the clock. We need to be conscious of our compass. For many people, the first half of life is consumed by the clock. As young adults, we're very conscious of time. We're impatient, eager to get started with life. Later, as we start achieving goals, we're still watching the clock. We want to measure how much we're getting accomplished. For most of us, usually sometime in our 40s, we become aware of the compass. We begin to wonder why we're doing what we're doing. We question the value of what we've achieved. We examine whether we're fulfilled, and then we worry that we're not making a difference in this world. Ideally, as we get older, we start trying to achieve balance between the clock and the compass. We try to be conscious of both, which makes us more strategic. We ask, what can I do that will make the most difference in the time I have left? We start talking about leaving a legacy. Ultimately, I believe that no matter what the age we are, we all need to seek a balance between the clock and the compass. In other words, we need to integrate a daily focus with a long-term sense of direction. This gives us a better perspective. Here are some thoughts on the clock and the compass. The clock. The clock is always ticking in this life. Time passes, and we either take advantage of opportunities or we miss them. So it's important to keep the clock in mind. But it's not the only thing if you want to live a life of significance. The compass. The compass is what we steer life by. It remains constant. And we're wise when we align ourselves with the direction we know we should be going. But just lining up with the compass doesn't get us anywhere if we don't start moving. The clock equals daily things. What are you doing? The compass equals destiny things. Where are you going? The clock deals with appointments and activities. The compass points toward vision, value, and mission. Together, the clock and the compass provide us with both motivation and direction. Finding a balance between them means that we're able to compound our efforts and add the most value that we can to our world. So the next time you plan your day, week, or year, be conscious of both the clock and the compass and see how far it gets you. I realize you might be missing the companion, and we can't leave that out. John said, a leader's potential is determined by those closest to him. Spend 80% of your time with the 20% closest to you. Let's think about that. Who is the closest to you? Are they adding value to your life? Do they have your best interests at heart? Are they investing and pouring goodness into your life? When I work with women in recovery, we talk a lot about their inner circles. Success in sobriety is about changing your people, places, and things in order to start a new life. But the same thing can be said for anyone. Do you surround yourself with quality people? We also talk about having an accountability partner, someone who knows all about you, your strengths and your weaknesses, your past, your goals, and your day-to-day struggles. Someone who's committed to being kind but honest when you're asking for feedback. Someone who will help propel you forward instead of setting up roadblocks. Now, this isn't a one-way relationship. You should be held accountable by the same principles and be prepared to offer the same in exchange. Dr. Nikki Martinez shares her ideas on how to surround yourself with positive people found at everydaypower.com. Sometimes it's better to end something and try to start something new than imprison yourself in the hope of the impossible. 
That came from Karen Salmelson. This quote is reflective of the idea of letting toxic people go from your life and either focus on the healthy relationships you have or develop new ones that help you grow as a person. The same woman said something that is often repeated, sometimes you don't get closure, you just move on. No one loves this fact, but that does not make it any less true. So many people walk around hoping for this great apology, the closure they need to hear to finally move on. That the person was wrong, that they treated them badly, that they wished the best for them and just wanted them to be happy. That would be wonderful, almost utopian, but sadly, this is not how things go and we end up hurting more than ever. Learning to find our own closure and focus on our energies around positive people in our lives is one of the healthiest choices we can make for ourselves. Here's how to surround yourself with people who lift you up. Can you find closure with a toxic person? Think about that. That apology almost never comes and people end up feeling worse about things than they did when the conversation started. We cannot control anyone but ourselves, no matter how much we may want to. We only have control of ourselves and our own desire for growth and change. Part of that growth and change is deciding the type of person we allow in our lives and the positive impact they can have on us. No matter how much we want to change someone, even if they need to change their own behavior, only they can make the decision to make any alterations in their lives. It hurts us to see people be self-destructive, But they must see that what they're doing is not working, and then they need to look for other alternatives. It can be argued that we're being self-destructive by keeping them in our lives over the people who lift us up. We need to know that we didn't deserve the poor treatment of toxic people, and that the best thing we can do for ourselves is to move on and genuinely know in our hearts that we deserve better. When we know we deserve better, we tend to attract better and healthier people. There are so many types of toxic people in our lives, and weaning them out will help us get our personal relationships in shape. Cut the fat, so to speak, and to appreciate and embrace the people who build you up and make you the best version of you. Toxic people are often competitive, negative, resist and even sabotage your growth and change. Those people may have a number of motives. Some of them think that you will no longer want them in your lives if you are to grow and get healthier as a person. But for the context of what we're talking about, that is mostly true. They might feel like your improvements point out the areas in their lives that they need to seriously work on. Or sadly, they might simply be jealous of your success. Those are the friends who cannot let you have your moment in the sun. The ones that have to tear you down to build themselves up. As the truth is, they don't feel very good about themselves. Positive people build you up, encourage you, and celebrate your success. Surround yourself with positive people who support and encourage your happiness and development as opposed to trying to sabotage it. You know who treats you poorly. You know who tears you down instead of building you up. What you may not know is how to remove these toxic people from your life. Sometimes it feels like you want to get permission, especially if the person has been in your life for a long time and sometimes they could even be a family member. The answer to this question is always yes. You can let anyone in your life go who treats you poorly, tears you down, and doesn't have your best interests at heart. This is about what is healthiest for you and a person's lack of willingness to change. direct approaches where you tell the person directly why you're removing them from your life. However, they may not be open to hearing this, and the explanation may be more for your closure than it is for them. 
This is the simplest way to go, but you have to surmise for yourself what's the best option for you. A letter is another option as it may help you express yourself better than a spoken word. You can also edit the writing and be certain what you're saying is what you really need to say. Dr. Nikki says another method is what I like to call successive approximations. The name is based on a famous psychological term, but I've put it in my own twist for other toxic relationships. By successive approximations, I suggest to the person that they cut the person out of their lives little by little until they're gone. Take longer to return calls or emails and texts. To be unable to meet up when they would like to. Don't be so available. This might be surprising advice, and it might be advice that doesn't work well with people lacking introspection, but it can be a safer route for some people in certain dynamics. If you decide to go the route of addressing things head on, keep things as brief and clean as possible. You don't owe them a long, drawn-out explanation, and the fact is that this won't likely be received well anyway. Try concentrating on I statements instead of you. This is what I need. This is what I want instead of this is what you're not doing. Dr. Nikki's suggestion is to do this in a public place to hopefully avoid a scene. If possible, block them from being able to get a hold of you, meaning block their phone number or email or social media. Close the avenues with which you can be contacted or abused. Now, focus your energies on the people that you want in your life and those that you may have had all along but didn't appreciate. No matter what route you decide to take to cut out toxic people from your life, I can guarantee one thing, you will feel so much better once you've done it. We build up so much tension and anxiety leading up to this event that I always encourage people to deal with things as quickly as possible. I can also guarantee that you set yourself up for a future full of potential and greater happiness by making the conscious decision to only surround yourself with positive people in your life. What have you done today to surround yourself with positive people? When you create a world where you only allow positive people into your inner circle, you create a life with unlimited potential and a system of support. We are always talking about the journey to self-discovery, which starts with a willingness to embrace new ideas while letting go of past beliefs and being eager to get to know yourself in a new light. Even though that sounds fun, it isn't always easy. There are tools and strategies you will need to have on the successful journey. You will need to be self-aware, aware of your time, your direction, and your need for support. No matter where you are in the process, just contemplating the trip, charting your course, or packing your bags, notice the threes, or maybe you're well into your journey and are at mile marker, oh, I don't know, number 50, you've taken a pit stop or have gotten off course, let's pull out the compass and get reoriented. And here are seven tips to help you embark on a journey of self-discovery found at bodyheart.com. Self-discovery is the process of asking oneself, who am I? The desire to answer this question is one of the most powerful motivations for contemplative practice. Despite its modern reputation as a physical and mental wellness tool, meditation is primarily a method of self-discovery. Health benefits can be a consequence of successful contemplation, but they don't need to be the goal. So what is self-discovery? Exploring the concept of self. The definition of self-discovery depends on what type of self you want to find, as well as the lens through which you perceive the concept of self. In non-spiritual, literal, or capitalistic perspectives, the description is simple and objective. The self is our flesh and blood, the information on our identification cards, and the materials we own. As we depart from the purely physical, 
the concept of self becomes rich and complex. The who am I question branches into inquiries of purpose, role, and responsibility. Before you meditate on these aspects of self, consider which philosophical framework will guide you best on your path to self-discovery. You may choose any view that satisfies you, or you may invent your own. Perhaps Aristotle's pursuit of virtue is appealing. Or maybe Buddhism will offer the most interesting idea of spiritual purpose. Don't choose based on obligation or pressure. Only authentic choices will lead you to the authentic self. If you were raised in a religious community, you don't need to include those teachings in meditation. Self-discovery should be a pleasant experience that provides both enjoyment and sustenance. Making a living by doing what you love, for example, can be a reward from self-discovery. Another potential outcome is increased creativity. No matter the specific result, you'll know you've arrived when you feel balance and harmony in your life. There are also practical benefits to the pursuit of self-discovery. When people know their purpose, they're able to become more powerful and take control of their lives. If you don't define yourself and purpose, you will be vulnerable for the oppressors. These people know their purpose. But instead of employing their power in a magnanimous way, they target the subjugate people who are not interested in self-discovery. If you discover your purpose through an enlightened path such as meditation, you'll be able to lift yourself up and those around you. This will result in a ripple effect and inspire others to do the same. So here are seven tips to help you embark on the journey of self-discovery. Number one, visualize your ideal self. Some people start with their ideal self hidden in the dark. It's there, but they can't see it. These methods and questions are sparks that will gradually illuminate the complete image of the ideal self. Who do you want to be? What does the person feel like? What is that person doing? If envisioning the future doesn't cast any sparks, reminisce. Were there times when you felt like your ideal self? Were there experiences that made you feel like your ideal self? What were you doing then? For an activity-based approach, try reading. There are millions of books that contain documented meditations from people who attempted self-discovery over the course of thousands of years. Number two. Find out what makes your heart sing. Throughout even the most mundane, routine day, there are dozens of little activities and tasks you engage in that trigger a range of emotions. Document them and rate the feeling on a scale of energy from 0 to 10. Practice this for many days and eventually a pattern will emerge. If you're struggling with this exercise, here are some tips. Think about five senses touch or feeling, smell and taste, hearing and sight. What brings joy to these five senses? It's okay if your answers are simple. Number three, meditate on other questions. As I mentioned earlier, the who am I question is the center of a massive web of many curiosities. Each question leads to another thread, another crossroads, and more questions. The more you ask and answer, the more you'll move towards self-discovery. Here's an example. What do I want to do for a living? How can I make a living from what I'm doing? Would I be willing to settle for something else? If I did settle, would I still have time for what I love? Number four, have a critical view of ambition but not yourself. Self-discovery is an ambition, as well as a path that is paved with smaller sub-goals. 
When you map out your journey, be critical about whether the progress points and ultimate destination will be significant. Are you thinking big or are you trying to placate yourself with little moments of feeling victorious? If your goals feel easy, it's most likely too small. Anyone can spend a few minutes of the day taking deep breaths. This routine is a technique that should only be a part of a meditation, not a goal. Overcoming a form of suffering, on the other hand, is an incredible motivator because it's often a difficult journey. You might need to solicit help from others and spend many years meditating. Your sense of self, however, should not be a target of criticism. If you struggle during the pursuit of self-discovery, resist the urge to believe there is something wrong or missing in you. Challenge whether the questions, motivations, and methods are good enough, not whether you are good enough. Number five, write in a gratitude journal. Unfortunately, most of our natural thoughts are negative. Gratitude is an emotion, but also a practice that can correct some of your cynicism. When achievements are significant and positive, use them to fortify your mind by writing in a gratitude journal. If you have privileges of instances of good luck, don't feel guilty about them. Be grateful that there will be advantages to aid you in your journey. Remember to be honest about what you're grateful for. Writing down what you feel you should be thankful for is different than having authentic emotions. Number six, indulge in new experiences. Similar to reading, experiences are catalysts for imagination and self-reflection. New experiences can help people get out of their heads during anxious times. Set aside time to go out and do something new. Remember what I said earlier, self-discovery can be enjoyable. Don't have a lot of free time? Know that something is as simple as walking around the neighborhood can contain new inspiring experiences. As with all the advice, approach is practice with balance and an honest view of what is healthy. Dedicating too much time to novelties can become a distraction for deeper issues. Number seven, try a spiritual life coach. If you follow this recommendation of having big, difficult, and and ambitious goals for your self-discovery, you might need the support of a trusted advisor or a life coach. A class structure will also help you stay balanced and accountable as you meditate and learn about yourself. Remember, share, learn, and grow with each other. Okay, I think we're packed, gassed up, and ready to embark or rejoin the journey. I remember a time when the thought of self-discovery felt silly. I mean, I knew everything, right? You remember those days. I was so focused on me and my bubble or controlling the people around me that I didn't have time or the know-how to deep dive into myself, what I truly thought or really wanted. If someone would have asked me then, what do you want to be known for? I think I would have said a hard worker, someone who took risks. Today, a little older and well on my journey, I would say I want to be remembered as a person who cared, who took action to try and make a difference. I'm more self-aware these days, looking at life from a higher vantage point. And from here, I see plenty of places I can dig in and help. Nick Wignall leaves us with four psychological habits of highly self-aware people found at medium.com. Self-awareness isn't something you're born into. It's something you build through practice. Isn't that great to know? And the best way to practice being more self-aware is to build habits that encourage it. So here are four habits of highly self-aware people that you can use to become more self-aware yourself. Number one, they're curious about their own mind. Self-aware people are curious about how their minds work. They frequently think about their thoughts and thinking patterns. 
Technically, this is called metacognition. It means that you're aware of the fact that you're thinking about things and able to assess the quality and usefulness of that thinking. For example, people often say things like, I just got so worried and I couldn't stop thinking of all the bad things that might happen. And before I knew it, I was in the middle of a panic attack. In reality, worry is something you do, not something that happens to you. It's a habitual pattern of thinking that leads to tremendous anxiety and stress. But without the habit of thinking about your thinking, it feels like something that just happens to you. Number two, they take feedback seriously. Genuinely self-aware people have the humility to understand that they can't always see themselves objectively. And they know that often the best way to be more objective about yourself is through the lens of others. The trick here is that there is no trick. If you want to see yourself through other people's eyes, you have to ask. It's that simple. Do you frequently get into conflict at work? Identify a coworker for whom you respect and ask for their honest opinion about the situation. Does your spouse keep telling you that you don't listen? Ask someone else in your life that you're close to to whether that they think you don't listen. What's their opinion? Or maybe the situation is more general. Maybe you just feel a little dissatisfied with your life and suspect that it has something to do with but You can't put your finger on it. Look for someone in your life who knows you well and ask them to see if there's any patterns or tendencies that would make you feel that way. Number three, they listen a lot more than they talk. When it comes to self-awareness, you can't think your way into it. Of course, there's nothing wrong with a deliberate self-reflection. In fact, it probably will facilitate self-awareness to a degree, but it won't be sufficient for building self-awareness because we're social creatures who learn primarily through each other. The quest for self-knowledge is a fundamentally social endeavor, but simply being around other people won't do the trick. Self-awareness comes from genuine interaction with other people, from conversation, But to get there, you need to be able to listen, to really listen. The key to gaining meaningful self-awareness through listening is to manage your own thoughts during a conversation. It's hard to truly listen when you're formulating your own ideas and only halfway paying attention to theirs. Which means building the habit of being a good listener is mostly about learning to undo unhelpful habits. Number four, they don't judge themselves for how they feel. It doesn't make any sense to pass moral judgment on something you can't control. This is why in the legal system, no one gets sent to prison for feeling really angry. You only get convicted and punished if you act on that feeling in a way that harms someone else. You can't control your emotions, but you can control your actions. So we all know intellectually that judging ourselves for how we feel doesn't make any sense. And yet, we still do it. Constantly. We tell ourselves we're bad for feeling angry. We criticize ourselves for feeling anxious instead of confident. We judge ourselves as weak because we feel sad and hopeless instead of optimistic. You wouldn't judge other people for having brown hair, green eyes, or even an alcoholic father because none of those things are under their control. So why are you judging yourself for how you feel when it's not something you can control? If you're constantly judging your emotions, you won't have any energy left to understand them. The solution is to learn to observe your emotions and notice them without passing judgment on them. And the best way to get started with this is to practice labeling your emotions with simple, plain language. Anytime you feel upset, instead of avoiding the feeling or glossing over it with vague language like, I'm stressed or I'm overwhelmed, try describing how you feel like a child would. I'm angry. I feel afraid. I'm sad. 
I feel guilty. I'm lonely. I feel proud of myself. When you get in the habit of describing your emotions in plain, ordinary language rather than intellectualizing them, you'll find that you have a clear insight into those emotions and how to respond to them in a healthy way. If you want to share Encouragementology with a friend who needs to know they are not alone in this journey of self-discovery, you can visit Encouragementology.com or anywhere you stream your content to receive this episode and all others. Follow us on Facebook for additional encouragement throughout the week. So I challenge you to pack light for your journey as you will pick up plenty of tools along your way. Maximize your time as you shoot for your goals, allowing those who care to support your efforts. Build the necessary network by investing your time and energy into others. I know you can do it. Thank you for listening to Encouragementology with Kendall Boyson, where we find positive ways to handle some of life's challenges. Someone's through until the past was clear. That's when I found you.